Good day, this is Jim Pytel from Columbia Gorge Community College. This is Digital Electronics One. This lecture is entitled PLDs, which stands for Programmable Logic Devices and Logic Circuit Implementation Using PLDs. Okay, at this point in your studies for digital electronics, you should be kind of familiar with me speaking about programmable logic devices, FPGAs, CPLDs, SPLDs, PALs, PLAs, GALs, uh, PROMs, and some of you guys might be thinking that they are something like Bigfoot or your lab partner's really hot Canadian girlfriend. Things that people talk about, but we never touch. Well, check it out, guys. These are real, and we're going to start talking about them. We're going to start implementing them in this unit. What is a PLD? Like I said earlier, it's a programmable logic device. What it means, it comes in as a blank slate, and you can put on that thing whatever you want to provided it fits. So you got your fixed function integrated circuits versus your PLDs. We've done some fixed function devices already, so let's just talk about those. What do they do? They do a single function and they do it well. It's optimized for that single function. If it's optimized, it's probably lower power consumption. Problem with them, they're not flexible. They're fixed, not flex. I'm not even going to spell it. They're not flexible. And I know some of the cheapy ones are not expensive, but if you could imagine you're trying to implement a large system, they're expensive if you custom make them. So that's potentially advantages, disadvantages. Whereas programmable logic device, what are their advantages? Well, they're quick to develop. They're quick prototypes. You can come up with this crazy idea and implement it on this programmable logic device. What is that advantageous for a company? Think about you can get something in the market really quick. You don't have to wait for some manufacturer to make this thing for you. The other thing is, is too, is once you're in the market, you can stay in the market longer because you can always update it and upgrade it because as opposed to this guy, this thing is flexible. You think about like a, a large system requiring a number of physical devices to be interconnected together. You could potentially put this thing on a single piece of equipment provided it fits, provided the whole design fits on that particular device you're trying to program. You know, think about the real estate, the physical real estate taking up on a board versus one chip versus 10 chips. You know, for those really lightweight applications, let's say aerospace, it's far better to have a little tiny device as opposed to several devices. Some of the disadvantages, they're not necessarily low power, unless you've got something like a PLD specifically designed to be low power, like Micro Semi has what's known as the Igloo Nano. It's super tiny, super, super low power. It's specifically designed for low power applications. The other thing is, whereas fixed, you know, it's fixed, it's programmed on there. The PLDs sometimes are what's known as volatile. It's got a program in it, and if you power it off, power it back up, it's gone. So you have to sometimes have external devices that can load the program back on it. Okay, so we discussed the differences between PLDs and fixed devices. Well, let's go ahead and talk about kind of the scheme about programmable logic devices and how you program them. Okay, there's several ways to go ahead and program a PLD, and one of the most general ways is schematics. You know, like a schematic edit uh, editor, very similar to what I've been drawing up until this point, you know, an AND gate, an OR gate, an exclusive OR gate, and you just tying them together. It's just pictures. And you go ahead and tie those things together. And it's not like I can just draw this on a piece of paper and put the piece of paper on top of the FPGA and it programs itself. What I'm saying is, is you need a piece of software that is compatible with that programmable logic device that you go ahead and, you know, something like Multisim, there are companies that make schematics editors that will take that schematic that you've drawn and go ahead and download it. Not, I'm not saying Multisim does this. What I'm saying is, is that's something you're familiar with. You know, you're taking a resistor and tying it up with a battery, tying it up with a switch. It, sim it simulates it. Imagine that same thing is a different type of software where you can draw pictures of AND gates and OR gates. And what you do is you go ahead and draw this, this uh, logic circuit and send it to the PLD and it programs itself. Well, the software programs it doesn't program itself because then you'd be in that realm, the self-programming machine, which is why I picked that picture. If you guys don't know what that, me what that image is right now, why don't you stop this lecture right now and go watch 2001 Space Odyssey. You'll get the joke. So we're talking about methods of programming. So schematics, that's simple. 
that's you can do that. It's kind of just pictures. The more popular way, believe it or not, is to program it with text. Okay, when I say text, is that's the VHDL that I've been alluding to all this whole time. Those are those uh, assignment operators that we've been dealing with that I'm trying to slowly but surely bring you into this realm. What it is, it's almost like programming. And when I say there's a difference in programming and what we're actually doing, what we're doing is it's called a hardware definition language. HDL. It's a little bit different, but very closely related to software program. Software program, like writing a program. There are fundamental differences between software programming and hardware definition languages. And we'll come up and uh, as we get into these fundamental differences between them, I'll actually try to go ahead and highlight some of the differences. A software program, if you can imagine about it, it's a sequential, it's a flow do this, then do that. Take the results of that, then do this. Whereas hardware definition language, you're really programming hardware, the physical interconnections of things, things that you can pull off a shelf. And I'm putting quotation marks about that because there are things out there that are non-instantiable, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. For example, like AND gate. You can go find an AND gate, pull that off the shelf, but there is like a wait for 20 nanoseconds. You can do that in hardware definition language, but you can't find it on the shelf. I go to the shelf and get me a 20, wait for 20 nanoseconds. So there are kind of a little bit of idiosyncrasies about a hardware definition language. Kind of the, the point is hardware definition language is creating hardware, software program, it's creating a sequential series. HDLs, Whereas opposed to being sequential, they are simultaneous, parallel. Everything happens at once. And that's kind of a hard concept for humans to understand, whereas computers excel at doing things simultaneously in parallel. Those individuals that potentially have a background in software programming, this you may instantly notice the similarities, but however, there is a very clear wall between sequential versus parallel. Let's go back to what we're talking about, these text input languages. It's a language. There's accepted grammar. There's accepted words. And quite like languages, there are different versions of it. There's English, there's Spanish, there's Chinese, of which there are several different versions of that. So what I'm saying is, is there are different ways of implementing text. You could program it in VHDL, which is the one I'm the most familiar with, and Verilog. Both of these are very popular languages, and they have very slight similarities between them, quite like French and Portuguese and Spanish, you know, as part of the Latin family of languages, but they're not exactly directly transferable. Do you need to know both of them? Not necessarily, because if you can program in VHDL, the idea is that that should be portable. If you could program in Verilog, the idea is that program should be portable. And this is the crazy advantage of having these standardized languages. The designs are portable. If you program something in VHDL and download it to a particular manufacturer's using their particular manufacturer software to a particular manufacturer's device, you can take that same program and go to a different manufacturer using a different software utility or program a different device. This is really, really cool. The only thing is that's different is you can write that program. You can write this program. This is what people kind of freak out. Oh, I must have this particular manufacturer's software utility to do even the first step. No, no, no. You can use notebook. You can use notebook on your computer to write a VHDL program because that's all it is. It's a high level language, meaning you don't need ones and zeros. You can use quasi-English statements to describe it, and you can write that in Notepad, okay? And that's free on your computer. There are easier ways of doing it. There is the software utility, for example, from the company Xilinx. There is a software utility from the company called Altera. Xilinx has this thing called the ISC, and this is the free one, this Webpack Project Navigator. They've got a more advanced version, I think it's called Vivado. And don't worry about these things. Is you don't have to use that one. You don't have to have the latest version either. Altera's got Quartus 2. There's something called Aldec Active HDL. What they are is things that will help you write HDL. And how do they help you write HDL? You can create these things called VHDL modules in the Webpack where you define your ins and outs. It kind of writes the program 
at least the beginning portions of it for you. And then what's really cool is it kind of highlights specific characters and keywords and kind of structures it for you. That's really cool, but you don't need to do that because you can write this thing in notebook. Don't think you need all the bells and whistles up front. You just need to be able to write these things. Let's talk about hardware definition language. Again, we already talked about hardware, the difference between software and hardware, sequential versus parallel, where we talked about the differences in language. And this D right here, it's a description. It's a description how it behaves. And this is where we get into the realms of these self-programming machines. <laughs> okay, so it's kind of it's still pretty spooky. We're definitely in charge, but there are ways of describing the behavior of a logic circuit that you don't necessarily even need to know the logic internally. All right, you don't even know, need to know how it does it. You can tell the machine, hey, I want you to do that, and it implements, poof, mathematically. Okay, It's actually a lot more. We're still in charge. Humans are still in charge. But uh, it's, that's what I'm referring to is the difference between this data flow slash structural approach versus what's known as behavioral. Some people like to divide up data flow and structural. They're all kind of the same thing. I think there's really only two ways. Some people say three, one, two, or some people say one, two, three ways to program it. Data flow structural is kind of what we've been doing already. It's logic gates. I'm designing those logic gates, hooking them up. It's the expressions. I, I don't necessarily have to draw the logic gate. I can say this and that or that. Whereas behavioral, behavioral is kind of cool. It's basing, and we'll, we'll go into these things in a little bit more details, and some of this might be going over your head right now. Behavioral is pretty cool. It's describing how the outputs react to certain inputs. I don't care how the thing does it. I want, you, here's this crazy complicated thing that has the following inputs, and I want the following outputs to happen when these inputs occur. So you kind of create like this, if this, then that, if this, then that. Notice something very similar to those individuals that are familiar with software programming, those if-thens, when this. There's kind of these loops, and we'll go into that. Okay, so that's kind of the description. It's describing it. Okay, so hardware, we talked about it. Definition or description, language, HDL. What's the V stand for? Very high speed integrated circuit. So now you know what VHDL stands for. And VHDL basically is the tool we're going to use to implement digital logic circuits on a PLD. Brief moment to describe some of these differences. What's the difference between Xilinx and Altera? The answer is, is 20 minutes. Okay, that's a funny joke that oh, my man Craig Keefe from Cosmiac, he's the guy that hosted the National Science Foundation Allied Trade Education FPGA Beginner and Advanced Workshop that I attended. It doesn't really matter which particular piece of hardware you choose or which particular piece of software from a manufacturer, as long as your program fits on that particular device, because these things do take up sizes, they take up physical spaces with on that device. As long as that thing fits, it should be the digital circuit you design should have the desired output. So who manufactures FPGAs? Well, these guys, a number of other folks out there. And what's really neat is, you know, you can buy an FPGA and it's not going to do much because it's this black box that just sits there with a bunch of balls underneath it. If it's a ball grid array, it's going to sit there. It doesn't really interact with the world. There are companies out there which are making these development boards, which are really cool. What it is, it's got an FPGA on it and it's got a bunch of inputs and outputs on it. So it's really neat. You don't have to do a lot of wiring. You could have some seven-segment displays. You could have some push buttons. You could have some slide buttons, some serial interface. You could have a USB interface, and that's how you program it. You're going to be typing on your computer. Hook it up to the USB. It's going to program it because it's got your little memory on there because, again, it's volatile. Some of these guys are volatile. You can store your program on there and at reset. It's going to load it into there. There are sometimes these little expansion connectors that you could in some, put in some peripheral devices. That's what's known as a development board, or some people call them prototyping boards. The examples of this is you take an Altera Cyclone 2, a Cyclone 2, that's one of their FPGAs. It's got a bunch of different types. Go visit their website. Go check it out. What are their FPGAs? Just go to products, go to FPGAs. So what this, the DE2 board, what it is, it's an Altera Cyclone 2 put on this thing with a bunch of interfaces. 
Xilinx. They've got their Spartan 3E board. It comes in two different models, a 500 and a 1200. They stick it on a board. Actually, they don't even stick it on their board. This company called Digilent makes this thing called the Nexus 2. What is it? Well, it's a Spartan 3E 500 or 1200 on this prototyping board. They also make this thing called a Nexus 3, which got a Spartan 6 on it. So you might see me use a bunch of Nexus 2 and Nexus 3 examples. And I'm, I'm actually looking at one right now. It's a Nexus 2 1200 sitting right here on my desk. I'll flip flop back and forth between these devices. What's the difference between these things? It's just the pin outs, really. It's going to end the size. You just got to go ahead and define what are your ins and what are your outs. And we'll talk about that from uh, different UCF files. So let's go into a kind of the big picture of these things. One thing before we go into the big pictures, I, I mentioned that the uh, pinouts and the UCF files, this software, you need this software from Xilinx to program a Xilinx device because what it's doing, it's doing the place and route for their boards, for their FPGAs or CPLDs, whatever. Same thing for Altera, you need their software. Okay, at that point, your little notepad uh, or WordPad or whatever you're using, now you need their software. Okay, well, I said you can you can write a program. Yes, you can definitely write a program using cheap, free resources. You need their stuff to go ahead and actually do the place and route. It does the work for you individually, connecting or disconnecting as you desire. Don't think you can go in there and do this yourself. You got that incredibly useful piece of software, which is free which is free. They want you to use these things. Go ahead and visit those websites, Silex and Altera. You can even download some of these things. I'm going to put a link as to how to download particular software resources we're going to go ahead and use later on this quarter. You can put it on your laptop, home computer. We are going to make them available for you in the lab. Okay, let's go into a, kind of some high level thinking here. Before you program a PLD and before you even go to the next slide, what you want to do with this thing Okay, and that's the thing, it's kind of a problem statement. Those individuals that have gone through software programming, that's really the big thing is what's the problem? The actual implementation of a program is just really writing the grammar and dictionary and certain words that you need to do that. The statement of the problem and understanding the problem and how you're going to get it done, basically what I'm telling you is the solution. Coming up with a solution is the hardest thing. And that's what I'm intending to teach you with a lot of this precursor information to this and information that will follow later on. We're going to go ahead and learn how to simplify a logical circuit. You need to come up with the solution. You need to go ahead and look at the problem. And that's how the rest of this course is organized. What I'm teaching you right now is a tool to go ahead and implement that solution. But this is the picture that I want to actually spend some time on here. Okay, so this is kind of the stages, and I have not drawn any arrows here, in the PLD implementation scheme. And you might think it's boxes, but uh, that they have no connection to each other, and they're very clearly defined in between them. It's actually better to think about this as kind of these fuzzy blobs, uh, because you may be in between the design entry and synthesis phase, and uh, you're going to go back and forth between them. But this is kind of the general scheme of these things. So a design entry. You're going to enter the design, kind of like I was just talking about earlier. How are you going to enter it? Maybe with an HDL, a hardware definition language. Maybe you're going to use a schematic capture. Maybe you're going to use something like C++ to a, a gate compiler. You might even download these prepackaged things called I. P cores, intellectual property. They're, they're pre-made circuit. There are a bunch of different ways to actually enter this thing. And that schematic capture, I know you like, yeah, that's what I want to do. I already understand that. It's going to get confusing real quick. Yeah, you can hook up an AND gate and put two wires on it for the inputs and a wire for the output. Imagine doing an 8-bit adder with 8 bits, 8 bits in parallel with the outputs. Yeah, it gets confusing and time-consuming real quick. That's why you use text, because there are shortcuts. So the design entry, these software utilities allow you to do a behavioral simulation. But what is a behavioral simulation? Is your logic correct? You don't design this thing, instantly go to hardware, and just hope it works. It's not a straight shot from problem to solution to implementation, getting a finished product. There's this 
back and forth between them. So what you do is you kind of do a behavioral simulation first. If that behavioral simulation didn't work, you go back, try it again, try it again. And so behavioral simulation is, does the logic work? It doesn't care about the device. You could be programming one manufacturer's device or another manufacturer's device. It doesn't care what the device is, does the logic work? It's assuming there is no delay, assuming a thing fit on the particular device. It's not device specific. Once that design entry is done and your behavior works, you kind of move on to this synthesis. It's kind of this check before it creates a net list for this device. It's checking your syntax. And the syntax is kind of the grammar. It will tell you, hey, you're supposed to put a semicolon there, expecting a semicolon. Hey, you can't do that with a NAND gate. You know, it's going to tell you generally where in that VHDL code the problem is. It can't fix stupid designs. That's the problem is you might be creating a code that is unnecessarily large or complicated because you didn't do logic circuit simplification up here because you didn't use the Boolean laws and De Morgan's theorem, which we'll be going over later, because you didn't do a Carnot map. You got this crazy, complicated circuit. And that's what I'm trying to teach you outside of this particular lecture. This is just the tools to go ahead and implement that. Once the synthesis is done, it's going to create this net list or basically a file. Don't worry about the names of the files right now. And now is where you need that person's hardware, that particular hardware for that device. Because what it's going to do is now you can do a functional simulation, whereas the behavioral simulation is kind of, and there's, there's a bit of crosstalk here, the behavioral was just the logic. Functional simulation can, can kind of be divided into timing analyses, functional simulation based upon the device. Now that there is a delay is your logic still going to work? You know, it's it's actually going into that specific hardware. Once everything works there, what you actually do is you're going to go ahead and implement this thing. And the slang term often used for this is called place and route. It basically assigns ins and outs for that particular board based upon your design and it's going to actually connect those logical elements within that particular programmable logic device to implement your into your device and that's when you have programmed it and now it's basically an in circuit verification you're going to go actually go ahead and test did this thing really work and sometimes it's great and you got a finished product and sometimes you're back at square one okay or square zero in the case of binary this is a pretty fuzzy uh description of it but be aware you just can't go from the beginning straight to the end and it's going to work out there are times when you need to be declaring, okay, I am using this particular manufacturer's device and their software. And there are times where it is, again, portable. Up until the point you're actually programming, actually doing the synthesis, you are, and again, there's kind of that fuzzy line there. It should be device A specific. When I say A specific, I mean not specific, okay? It should be portable. Okay, so let's just do a brief, brief overview. Not necessarily brief, because you know how I talk. Uh, just let's say a general, a general overview of how VHDL, one of the tools used to go ahead and do this design entry. The structure of VHDL, let me go ahead and erase some of this. Okay, so how a VHDL program is kind of organized, there's three things. You got your library, your entity, and your architecture. I certainly hope I spelled that correctly. Library entity architecture. In the general scheme of things, the library, it's the language you're using and the dictionary from which you're getting the words. Are you doing logic? Are you doing arithmetic functions? Are you doing uh, signed numbers? The point is, you don't necessarily have to have all the books in the library, okay? If you're doing just a particular application, just use that one book because if I took every single book with me, it would make my program unnecessarily large. Okay, this is one of those finer points. Do I need to have all the books in the library if I just want to talk about one thing? Uh, the entity, that's the ins and the outs. All you're doing is declaring a box. What's coming into it? What's coming out of it? Maybe a couple outs. What's the name of the box? It doesn't matter what's 
in the box because that's not the entity's job. You got a factory, the happy cat, cat food factory. What's coming in is corn husks, ground up gym mats, and baby harp seals. What's coming out? Cat food. That's the end of the entity. You don't need to worry about what's going on in the factory. You may not even want to know what's going on in that factory. The architecture. What's inside the factory? I dread to see what's inside there. How it functions. Basically, the logic. The logic, the schematic, the behavioral description of what's going on with those ins and outs. Like I said earlier, structural and data flow, it's kind of logic gates and the expressions. Behavioral, it kind of describes the behavior outputs given the states of inputs. We'll go into those a little bit later. Uh, how we, and we're actually going to do a little bit of investigation on the entity statements and architecture statements with some follow on lectures here. Right now, just think of the entity as the box. You got some ins coming into it, outs coming out. The architecture, what's inside? How does it do it? What's the expression for cat food? You know, I'm going to call it C is assigned husks and seals or gym mats and seals and statement that's and there's a bunch of stuff around above and below it that i need to go ahead and define it's how it works let's talk before i go into these individual entity and architecture statements let's talk about something specific to vhdl comments i'm writing this program and not necessarily this humanly com comprehensible language. It is kind of comprehensible, but it's not necessarily as descriptive as we'd like. What we do is we often put in comments. And a comment in VHDL is these guys. Okay, they're put to the left of it. And what you do is you can say a note to yourself. Hey, I am anding this guy and oring that guy, which will produce an intermediary result, which will be fed to this. It's a note to yourself how you did something. And this is one of those things that's almost like a time capsule. You can design this thing and then two years you come back to it and you're like, what the heck was this guy thinking when he made it? You know, you look at the author thing, you're like, oh, it, it was me. What was I thinking? I was thinking that. You can always go back and troubleshoot these things because like I said, these things are updatable and upgradable. You need to know how thing works. There's keywords and reserved words and there's these identifiers. For example, cat food, corn husks, it's the names. You know, the identifiers are the names for those data objects and the things that you're doing things with, the names for the data. Uh, and you can call them whatever you want to, as long as they follow certain rules. And one of the rules is they can't be a keyword, they can't be a reserve word, or it can't be an operator. We've already kind of discussed operators like or, and, like a keyword or a reserve word is entity or architecture. I can't name one of my inputs to this thing. I can't name it or I can't name it entity because those are words that I'm not allowed to use. I can name it corn husks with no space. I can name it corn underscore husks. I can name it corn one. There's a bunch of different ways. You can do uppercase. You can do lowercase. You can use numbers, but it's got to begin with a letter. Okay, so I can use corn one. I can't use one corn. I can use C. You can put an underscore in there. I think if there's any uh, other requirements. I think that's it. Oh, yeah, no spaces. You can't put a space in there. So you can't use, so these are all goods. These are all bads. Keywords, reserved words, operator, spaces. For example, tell me if this is good. Nope, because there's spaces in there. Okay, I can just run it all run it all together or put some underscores in there. One A. Nope. I can do A1. What about or? Nope. I can do or one. You'll figure out what are reserved words, what are keywords. And like I said earlier too, is uh, some of the software utilities developed by these manufacturers, it'll actually if you type out or, it'll highlight it in a different color. If you type out standard underscore logic, it'll highlight it in a different a color, you, it will tell you, yo, you're using keyword or a reserve word. Do you mean to do that? We talked about these identifiers. We talked about comments, data objects. We've already talked about that. I think that's actually kind of the description. I think that's kind of where I want to go, the high level overview of VHDL. But again, the general scheme is each program is going to have a library, the entity, which is the ins and outs, and you got your architecture. Okay, so let's actually go into 
the entity statement in particular, and we're going to do some examples about the entity statement.